Tatsumi was a weak loser working hard to make a name for himself in Capital. However, his life soon turns upside down when he gets to witness the darkness of Capital. On verge of despair, he gets to join a group of assassins and obtain a powerful ancient armor to get his revenge. On his way to the capital, Tatsumi encounters an earth dragon and while the merchants start panicking, Tatsumi gets out of the carriage and easily eliminates it using his sword skills. This results in him boasting about his skills to the merchants and telling them how he plans to become a famous knight in the capital. However, the merchants warn him that the capital is not a fantasy land but a place where dangerous monsters reside in the form of humans. Nonetheless, Tatsumi doesn't take their warning seriously and heads towards the capital, still carrying his hopes and dreams. After reaching the capital, Tatsumi visits the guild and gets kicked out after complaining about getting the lowest rank. He then runs into a girl with big talents, who offers to help him out. She takes him to a bar and promises to help him out if he pays her. The goody two-shoes ends up giving her all the money he had and later finds out that the girl scammed him. Having no money or place to stay, Tatsumi decides to spend the night outside when Aria, a girl from a royal family, notices him and offers him to stay the night at her house. He instantly agrees and Aria introduces him to her parents after they reach their home. Tatsumi informs her parents that he wants to join the military and save his village which has been in a dire situation for quite some while. Additionally, he has two other friends who he lost contact with and came to the capital in order to look for them aside from his goal of joining the military. After hearing his story, Arya's father promises to help him out with the military recruitment process. The next day, Arya takes him out shopping and while Arya is busy buying clothes, one of her guards shows him the imperial palace and informs him that the emperor of their nation is still a child and is manipulated by the prime minister who forces him to do all sorts of evil things. The guard also informs him about a group of assassins called the Night Raid and they attack their victims at night. He asks Tatsumi to be careful as the Night Raid mostly attacks high-ranking executives. Later that night, Arya's mother gets attacked by the Night Raid and Tatsumi decides to help Arya and the guard who is protecting her. While a member of the Night Raid named Akame is fighting the guards, Leon eliminates Arya's father. Tatsumi manages to catch up with Arya but unfortunately, Akame also arrives at the same time. However, Akim ignores him and eliminates the guard and just when she is about to put an end to Arya, Tatsumi arrives and blocks her attack. Having no other choice, Akim decides to eliminate Tatsumi too and just when she is about to strike, Leon, the girl who scammed Tatsumi a few days ago arrives and stops Akim from attacking any further. Leon smashed the door of the storage room behind them and what Tatsumi witnessed left him in despair. There were a ton of human corpses and not only that but the two friends he was looking for were also trapped there like cattle animals. Leon told Tatsumi that Arya's family brought country bumpkins to their house just to later trap them to their demise. Tatsumi realizes that one of his friends Iyasu is still barely alive and he tells Tatsumi that Arya was the one who eliminated their other friend Seo. Without wasting a second, Tatsumi took out his sword and brutally eliminated Arya. Sadly, Iyasu was on the brink of demise and passed away soon after. Before leaving, Leon decided to bring Tatsumi along to their secret base and told the other Night Raid members that he would be joining their group. After staying the night at the Night Raid's hideout, Leon decides to introduce Tatsumi to her other teammates. She starts off by introducing him to Shiel who tells him that he will end up losing his life if he decides not to join them. Afterward, Mine came to introduce herself and instead of greeting him, she mocked him and walked away. Up next, she introduces him to Bulat and while they are shaking hands, Leon informs Tatsumi that Bulat is not the straightest guy, which results in Tatsumi being a little more cautious around him. They then catch Lubbock staring at girls and Leon punishes him by breaking a few of his fingers. At last, she introduces him to Akame who is cooking fish by the riverside. She gives one to Leon but refuses to let Tatsumi eat as he has still not decided to join them. Leon then realizes that the leader of Night Raid, Nagenda, is also present and she gives Leon a hard time for delaying a deadline for completing a mission. Later that day, Nagenda gathers everyone and she tells Tatsumi that he will be free to not join their group but still be forced to work in their workshop as they can't let him go now that their hideout is exposed. Nagenda further informs Tatsumi that a group called the Revolutionary Army was forced to fight against the evil forces of the Empire and the Night Raid is their assassin team. They are not only taking care of the corrupt higher-ups, but they also plan to eliminate the root of all evil which is the Prime Minister of the Empire. After hearing her explanation, Tatsumi thinks that they are assassins of justice, which makes everyone laugh and Bulat tells Tatsumi that no matter how he phrases it, they are still assassins in the end. Eventually, he decides to join their team and Nagenda makes Akim responsible for Tatsumi's training. The training starts off with Tatsumi making breakfast for everyone the next day as Akim is responsible for making food and he is forced to assist her. 
She then takes him to the riverside and gives him the task of catching fish, but the pathetic lad only manages to catch two. While having dinner, Nagenda informs everyone about their next job which is to eliminate the imperial police higher up who is as corrupt as they get. Tatsumi decides to tag along with Akim and Leon and Nagenda gives him permission to do so. Before the mission started, Leon told Tatsumi a little about Akim and explained that she and her sister were bought by the Empire and trained to become assassins. The next night, their mission finally started and while Akim and Leon took care of their target, Tatsumi started following his plan to take out the police higher up named Ogre. Tatsumi manages to lure Ogre to a secluded alley and instantly attacks him. Just when Tatsumi thought that the target was eliminated, Ogre got back on his feet and pushed Tatsumi back. Ogre started overwhelming him but as soon as Tatsumi remembered the dirty things he had done, his motivation increased and he managed to put an end to him once and for all. After the mission is complete, Tatsumi reports everything to Nagenda and Akame takes off Tatsumi's clothes to check if he was hurt or poised by the enemy. Upon finding out that he was unscathed, he was overjoyed and praised him for doing well at his first job. However, Nagenda soon ruins the mood after telling Tatsumi that his next training partner will be mine. The whole group is on a mission when Bulat decides to show Tatsumi his personal armor which is called Incursio. Akame takes care of the three guards she is fighting and while Mine is trying to shoot one of them, a person tries to sneak up on her but Shield notices his presence and eliminates him swiftly. This gives Mine the chance to finish off the person she had noticed as well. Additionally, Lubbock and Bulat also eliminate the members of the group they are fighting and the mission comes to an end. At night, Tatsumi is trying to sleep and remembers the time he spent with his old friends. The next morning, Shiel finds Tatsumi waiting for Mine and tells him that she usually wakes up late. Just when she is about to go and wake her up, Nagenda asks Tatsumi to do it instead and when he enters her room, Tatsumi comes face to face with Mine who is still changing her clothes. This results in Mine firing an energy beam at his face which he barely dodges. However, doesn't stop there and shoots once again. Later, the two of them head out to explore town and during their walk, they notice two men teasing a little girl. Tatsumi takes out his sword and slashes their pants which makes the two of them embarrassed and they run away. Mine then tells Tatsumi that only Akane, Shiel, Bula, and Nagenda have their faces on the wanted poster and the rest of them are free to roam around the town. Afterward, Tatsumi follows Mine on her shopping spree like her minion until she is done buying everything she needs. Soon after, Tatsumi notices a commotion and Mine informs her that it is most likely a public execution as it happens all the time. Tatsumi goes to check it out and the sight of humans being treated like a shooting target makes him feel disgusted. On the other hand, the Emperor of the Nation sentences a man to his demise for not following the Emperor's policies. This makes the fatty Prime Minister praise the Emperor for his wise decision. The person sentenced to his demise tries to inform the Emperor about how he is being manipulated but guards and the Prime Minister shut him off before he can say any more. On the other hand, a person named Local is their next target who kidnaps women and beats them till they pass away. For this mission, Tatsumi is Mine's personal bodyguard and is responsible for her protection while she snipes at the target. Soon after, Mine notices the target but Tatsumi informs her that he is surrounded by innocent people. Nonetheless, that doesn't matter to Mine as she precisely snipes local, without even injuring the people surrounding him. His assassination alerts the guards and they make their way towards the mountain, only to run into the rest of the night raid waiting for them. On their way back, Tatsumi and Mine run into the captain of the guards protecting local. He seems to be more skilled than the rest of them and easily dodges all the bullets Mine shoots at him. However, Tatsumi manages to catch him off guard and asks Mine to snipe him. She takes up the offer and precisely lands the shot, without injuring the little dweeb who is holding him. Later, Tatsumi walks up to Mine and hits her on the head for burning his hair because of her snipe. This results in an argument between the two and the other members who rush towards them are relieved to see that they are doing okay. The next morning, Tatsumi is practicing with Bulat and quickly tires out after swinging his sword for a while. His practice is interrupted when Akame arrives and calls him to help out with breakfast. At night, Nagenda gathers everyone and informs them about their next target. He is a slasher who appears late at night and takes people's heads indiscriminately. Lubbock concludes that the person in question is undoubtedly Zank the Executioner. Mine elaborates that he was the executioner in the largest prison in the capital. He kept on executing people day after day until it became a habit and he started beheading people at random. Gilat also informs that Zank owns Imperial Arms and he can't be taken lightly. Turns out that he doesn't even know about Imperial Arms. Nagenda explains that around a thousand years ago, the first emperor of the nation wanted to make weapons that could be passed down into the future. In order to create them, he gathered rare materials from all around the world and managed to create around 48 weapons. Unfortunately, due to a war about 500 years ago, half of those weapons disappeared. Akame's sword is one of those weapons and not only that but all the weapons the other members of the Night Raid own are Imperial Arms as well. 
This makes Tatsumi want one for himself as well but Nagenda believes that he will receive one if it's meant for him. For now, they all head out to look for Zank but little do they know that Zank already has his eyes on them. Soon after, Tatsumi goes to an alley to take a leak and runs into his childhood friend Seo. He follows her to an unknown location and hugs her, only to realize that it was Zank the executioner in reality and he deceived Tatsumi using his imperial arm. He informs Tatsumi that his imperial arm is called Spectator and it allows him to find out what the opponent is thinking just by looking at their expression. Tatsumi makes the first move and Zank easily dodges it. During his next attempt, Zank easily predicts Tatsumi's moves using his imperial arm and manages to land a hit. Even though he is hurt, Tatsumi refuses to give up and gets back up. He gets hurt even more and eventually decides to put his everything into one attack. Tatsumi dashes towards Zank and manages to cut his face a little but Zank also cuts Tatsumi's back. Just when Zank runs at him to land another one of his attacks, Akame arrives and decides to take Zank on. The fact that he can predict the moves of his opponent doesn't mean anything to Akame as she manages to block every single one of his attacks, despite him having the advantage of knowing the future. In the midst of battle, Zank asks Akame if she hears the voices of people she has slain. However, Akame replies that she doesn't hear such voices, which disappoints Zank and he uses another ability of his imperial weapon and turns himself into Akame's little sister in her eyes. Tatsumi tries to tell Akame that she is only seeing an illusion but Akame doesn't need his help as she still easily attacks Zank. This deceiving ability makes Akame even more furious and she starts overpowering Zank, and eventually manages to swiftly cut his head. In his last moments, Zank shows his gratitude to Akame as the voices he is hearing have stopped. The next day, Tatsumi asks Akame about the person she was during her fight but she refuses to tell him and promises to let him know when the time is right. Tatsumi wakes up and finds Shiel sleeping by his side. Apparently, she is the one responsible for his training. On the other hand, Lubick wonders if Shiel can train Tatsumi without causing any trouble and Nijenda is confident that she can at least manage this much. Leon calls Dibs to be Tatsumi's next trainer and soon after Akame joins them as well and asks about the type of breakfast they want. Akame suggests eating meat as usual and even though Lubbock tries to reject the idea, the other girls instantly agree. Meanwhile, Tatsumi is wearing heavy armor and is swimming in the river current to improve his stamina. After completing his training, he asks Sheil what she typically does apart from training to which she replies that there is nothing much she can do. She burned the meat when Sheil tried cooking, made a mess when cleaning, mistook sugar for salt, and accidentally washed mine with the laundry. Afterward, she informs him about her past and starts the story by letting him know that she is clumsy and bad at everything from the start. Everyone used to rudely treat her apart from one friend who was always nice to her no matter what. One day, that friend's ex-boyfriend came and started strangling her because he was intoxicated. In order to save her friend, Sheil picked up a knife and slashed the boyfriend, even though the incident was ruled out as self-defense. Her snake of a friend never talked to her afterward. Later, the boyfriend's homies came to avenge him but were taken out easily by Sheil and this made her realize that she had a hidden talent in taking people's lives. Eventually, the Revolutionary Army recruited her and she became a part of the Night Raid. After returning back to the hideout, Nagenda gives the Imperial Arm they got from Zank to Tatsumi. He tries to use it and notices that he is able to see through the clothes. However, his enjoyment doesn't last long and Tatsumi starts feeling unwell. Akame removes the Imperial Arm as it starts to reject Tatsumi for being such a lowly loser. In the end, Nagenda decides to send it to the Revolutionary Army to see if someone there is compatible with it. She then hands over a book to Tatsumi with information regarding all the Imperial Arms. Talking about the strongest Imperial Arm, Nagenda informs him that it is one that uses the powers of ice, but the user is currently not present in the capital. The discussion about the Imperial Arms makes Tatsumi think that one of them might even have the power to resurrect humans but Bulat informs him that none of them have such powers. The first emperor would have already resurrected himself if such powers existed. This shatters all the hopes that Tatsumi had but luckily, Shiel decides to comfort him and makes him feel better by enveloping him in her arms. The next day, Tatsumi is hanging out with Leon when a bunch of guys start confronting Leon for scamming them. On the other hand, the Prime Minister had enough of getting bullied by the Night Raid and plans to call as death. The user of the Imperial Arm with powers related to ice, back to the capital to deal with them. While trying to run away, they get separated but luckily a member of the Imperial Police called Suryu decides to help Tatsumi out. Apparently, she has a little dog which is supposed to be an Imperial Arm. After showing him the way, Suryu thinks about how she has to avenge her late teacher, Ogre, who was eliminated by the Night Raid. It was finally time for Tatsumi to team up with Leon and perform his first mission. 
She transforms into her lion form and runs towards her destination after grabbing Tatsumi in her arms. After sneaking in, they notice that all the girls present inside the building are intoxicated by the owners and they are using them to earn money for themselves. After analyzing the situation, both of them break into the building and eliminate all the guards one by one. Eventually, only the two bosses are left and Tatsumi takes down one of them while Leon finishes off the other. On their way back, Leon tells Tatsumi that she has already contacted a doctor in the slums who will be willing to take care of the girls, which makes him realize that Leon might be a nicer girl than he initially thought. On the other hand, Mine and Shiel are returning back after completing their mission when Suryu unexpectedly arrives. Mine starts attacking them but Suryu's imperial weapon, Koro transforms and shields Suryu. Shiel manages to land a perfect strike on Koro but he heals instantly back. Mine saves Shiel by firing at Koro and informs her that Imperial arms have cores in their bodies and aren't destroyed until the core is destroyed. Suddenly, Koro transforms into an even buffed out version and starts raining down punches on Shiel. This gives Mine the opportunity to attack Koro with her energy beam but it manages to heal itself from the attack as the core remains untouched. Shiel decides to go for Suryu instead and pushes her into the forest. Koro tries to go after them but Mine stops it by attacking its body. Shiel keeps on overwhelming Suryu until she severs both her arms. Surprisingly, Suryu has a gun hidden in her severed arm and she fires at Shiel, only for the bullet to be blocked by Shiel's imperial arm. This time, Shiel cuts off her remaining limbs as well to ensure that no other hidden gun is left in her body. Seeing how the battle wasn't going their way, Suryu tells Koro to go berserk and it once again transforms. This time it is an even more powerful one and Koro manages to grab mine and starts crushing her. Luckily, Shiel runs at Koro and cuts off the arm which is crushing mine. Suddenly, Shiel is shot from behind and it turns out that Suryu has a hidden gun inside her mouth as well. This sudden attack paralyzes Shiel, giving Koro the chance to attack and split Shiel in half. Mine gets enraged and tries to attack Suryu but more Imperial police arrive. Shiel, on her last breath, uses her scissors ability to produce light that blinds everyone, giving Mine the chance to run away. During her last moments, Shiel's life flashes before her eyes and she apologizes to Tatsumi for not being able to hold him in her arms ever again. After returning back to the base, Mine gives the news to everyone and Tatsumi loses his cool and starts asking Mine all sorts of questions in order to avenge Shiel. Violet lands a punch on his ugly face and tells Tatsumi to calm down as everyone knows that they could lose their life at any given moment. The next morning, as Death finally returns back to the capital on the orders of the Prime Minister. After returning back to the capital, as Death is awarded 10,000 gold as a reward for completing her mission. She promises to get rid of the night raid and before she leaves, the Emperor asks Azdeth if there is something else she might need to which she replies that the only thing she desires to experience is love. The Emperor tries to recommend the Prime Minister but she refuses to waste her beauty on a fat pig like him. Afterward, she chooses three of her most powerful lackeys and sends them on a mission to take care of the night raid. On the other hand, Tatsumi wakes up in the middle of the night and notices Akame making some sweets. She informs him that these are the sweets that she liked and she wants to remember her even if everyone else forgets about her. He is surprised to see how calm Akame is and comments on how experiencing losing so many of her comrades must have made her get used to it. This statement makes Akame furious and she confronts Tatsumi, telling him that no matter how many comrades she loses, the pain of losing one is still the same and hurts every time. Tatsumi apologizes and promises to try his best and not meet his demise anytime soon. The next morning, he starts practicing his swordsmanship with Akame when Bulat joins and starts training him as well. On the other hand, one of the rare honest higher-ups of the nation is heading towards the capital when the team as if formed arrives and brutally slaughters all of them including the higher-up and her daughter. After they are done with the job, they make sure to leave some posters behind, framing Night Raid for the job and making them look like the culprit. Dejenda soon notices their moves and informs everyone about it, ordering Leon to head out to the capital and observe Esdeath's movement. Dejenda further tells the team that all the people who lost their lives because of Esdeath's team were people who cared about the nation and wanted to help in any way possible, to protect other innocent people from getting slain. Nagenda explains the two political officials that will be targeted next and asks Tatsumi, Bulat to guard one of them and Ak, Lubbock to guard the other one. Apparently, the target Tatsumi and Bulat are supposed to guard is present on a ship and Tatsumi boards the ship while Bulat stays invisible, which is one of Incursio's many abilities. While they are looking out for enemies, Bulat tells him the story of his past when a general he used to look up to was framed by the government. When the general returned to the capital, they refused to hear any of his appeals and set him up as a criminal. Soon after, the invisibility ability starts running out and Bulat goes into hiding, leaving Tatsumi to watch out for enemies. On the other hand, Leon watches over Esdeath and all her plans of targeting her vanish from her mind when she notices the evil and powerful aura radiating from her body. 
Back on the ship, as Death's team is present and one of them starts playing the flute. This music coming out of the flute makes everyone unconscious, but Tatsumi struggles and somehow manages to keep himself awake. Suddenly, one of the Ezdeth's team appears and starts fighting Tatsumi using his imperial arm. Just when Tatsumi is about to make a brain-dead move, Bulat arrives and punches the crap out of him. The Ezdeth's group member introduces himself as Daidara and Bulat chooses to fight him, asking Tatsumi to learn from his way of fighting. The other two try to attack Bulat at the same time but he kicks them away and cuts Daidara in half at the same time. Bulat then notices that one of the members is his previous general, named Liver, who was wrongfully accused by the capital. General Liver tells Bulat that it was Esdeth who saved him from the punishment and he decided to serve her for the rest of his life. Fortunately, Bulat is not bothered by this reunion and treats Liver as his enemy. Liver reveals his imperial arm which has the ability to control water. It is the worst situation to fight an ability that is related to water, considering they are currently present in the middle of the ocean. While Bulat is fighting Liver, Tatsumi decides to take on the flute guy but he instantly starts getting overwhelmed by the sheer speed of his attacks. Bulat manages to cut through one of Liver's attacks which prompt him to attack Bulat with multiple ones, which ends up dealing some damage. Even after the attack, Liver doesn't give it a rest and keeps on attacking Bulat until he thinks that Bulat is finished. However, Liver is severely mistaken as Bulat is still alive and lunges towards Liver to deal the finishing blow but is forced to deal with the flute guy, making him miss the sole chance he had. Tatsumi apologizes to Bulat for being a loser and not being able to hold off a skinny-looking wannabe musician. At this moment, Bulat has already exhausted Incursio and decides to fight Liver using his sword. Liver takes him on and after exchanging a few blows, Bulat manages to land one that almost finishes Liver off. However, Liver still has a trump card and uses a technique called Blade of Blood to control his blood and make it pierce through Bulat's body, dealing an enormous amount of damage. This attack uses Liver's own life force and he is not able to fight any longer but the same could be said for Bulat as the blood contains poison and its effects have already started to make things worse for Bulat. Now the only one left for Tatsumi to fight is the flute guy. He plays his flute once again in this time. His body transforms and turns into an even uglier version of Hulk, noticing how he doesn't have much time left. Bulat gives Incursio to Tatsumi and asks him to use it in this fight. Tatsumi hesitated for a while but eventually accepted it and called out its name. Surprisingly, the passion burning inside Tatsumi allows Incursio to upgrade its version and a new and even more powerful one comes out. Tatsumi can feel the overwhelming strength flowing through his body and both the flute boy and Tatsumi dashes toward each other, throwing punches. The strength of Tatsumi's punch turns out to be far greater, and he throws the flute boy away. He crashes into the ship structure with such force that ends his life. Bulat is impressed by Tatsumi but his life energy drains away and he looks at Tatsumi for one last time. After Bulat passes away, Tatsumi thanks him for giving Incursio and apologizes for always causing trouble while tears come out of his eyes. On the other hand, a messenger brings a message for Kurom, Akame's little sister, to come back to the capital as a new organization is being formed. After returning back to the hideout, Mine asks the other members to train with her only to realize that Tatsumi and Lubbock are already bus training, as they are the only boys left in the group after Bulat's demise. The main reason Tatsumi is trying to increase his strength is because of how much energy Incursio drains. Soon after, Nagenda arrives and informs them that she will be visiting the Revolutionary Army's hideout to deliver the Imperial arms they gathered from Esdeth's group. Before leaving, she makes Akame the leader and praises Tatsumi for doing a good job at the mission, even though they ended up losing Bulat. Leon also mentions that Bulat once told her how Tatsumi has potential and might one day even surpass his level of strength. Later that day, a man named Wave arrives at the capital and heads towards the Imperial Palace. He enters the room where he is supposed to meet his new team members and notices a weirdo with a mask intensely glaring at him. Hirom is the next one to arrive and just when Wave tries to introduce himself, she hushes him away as she thinks that Wave might be after her treats. Afterward, Suryu arrives along with Dr. Stylish. At last, a normal-looking boy arrives who goes by the name of Run. In the end, the weirdo with the mask introduces himself as Balls. Afterward, Esdeth, who is hiding her face with a mask arrives and starts fighting everyone present in the room. She manages to subdue all of them one by one but Kuro manages to break her mask, making everyone surprised after they realize that they were just fighting their boss. She includes all of them in her new team to take care of Night Raid and names this team the Jaegers. Meanwhile, Tatsumi visits the Night Raid's secret base at the capital and Lubbock informs him about Esdeth by telling him a story from the past. A few years ago, Esdeth and Nagenda used to be fellow generals and they were out on a mission. Even when the capital's army faced countless difficulties and their numbers significantly decreased, 
as Zeth's abilities were far more than enough to take care of the enemies. And seeing her enjoy torturing the enemies made Nejenda sick and she decided to leave the Imperial Army for good. Additionally, Lubbock also tells Tatsumi about the tournament as Death is managing and the winner is supposed to win a ton of money. Seeing how this might be a good chance to send some money back to his village, Tatsumi decides to participate. The next day, the tournament starts and as Death is watching all the fights and trying to find a boy she might fall in love with. Finally, it is time for Tatsumi's fight and his opponent is a literal fat cow. Even when the size difference between them is noticeable, Tatsumi doesn't give up and after using some clever moves, he manages to defeat it. As Death is impressed by his fighting style and the way Tatsumi smiles after his win makes As Death fall for him. She enters the fighting ring on her own and puts a chain on Tatsumi's neck. She plans to take him to her room and do all sorts of questionable things with the midget boy. After returning back to the base, Lubbock and Leon inform Akame about Tatsumi being kidnapped. This makes her change their hideout and also plan to do everything they can to bring Tatsumi back. The Jaegers go on their very first mission together and Ezdeth takes Tatsumi along as a backup member. He catches a glimpse of Suryu and barely manages to control himself from ending her life. All of them start the battle and easily slay their enemies. As Death tells Tatsumi that she will be training him on her own and will make sure that he becomes as strong if not stronger than them. After having a conversation with her, Tatsumi thinks about convincing As Death to become their ally and plans to try this strategy later at night. After returning to the Imperial Palace, As Death takes Tatsumi to her room and after taking a shower, she sits on the bed with him. The cherry boy receives his first kiss followed by As Death pinning him down. Tatsumi gathers up his courage and asks Ezdeth for a request, wanting her to fight along with him in the Revolutionary Army. This results in Tatsumi receiving a slap from her but he still doesn't give up and mentions how the two of them might become enemies one day. Ezdeth replies that it won't be happening as he will be staying with her forever. Tatsumi gets up and rejects her ideas, wanting Ezdeth to change her principles. The two of them start arguing and Tatsumi's stubbornness makes Ezdeth fall for him even more. The next day, she introduces Tatsumi as the backup member to everyone else and takes advice from Balls on how to make Tatsumi fall in love with her. The following day, Tatsumi visits the meeting room where Wave and Kurom are already present. He gathers up the courage and asks Kurom about Akame and she replies that Akame is indeed her older sister whom she wants to eliminate with her own two hands. Soon after, Ezdeth arrives and tells the members present in the room about their upcoming mission. She puts Wave and Tatsumi in a single team while Kurom and herself are in the other. On their way to the location of the mission, some monsters attack Tatsumi and Wave and during the fight, he finds the perfect opportunity to run away. Later, Wave realizes that Tatsumi ran away and transforms into an armor similar to Incursio to find him. On the other hand, Tatsumi had already managed to get away after using Incursio, but Wave found him soon enough. He thinks of Tatsumi as someone else and starts fighting him. Tatsumi keeps on getting destroyed by his attacks but he focuses on running away and manages to hide using the invisibility ability until Wave leaves. Soon after the incursion's abilities wear off and a beast appears in front of Tatsumi. Luckily, Akame arrives at the exact moment and saves Tatsumi after eliminating the beast. Their sentimental conversation is interrupted when Lubbock drags them back to the hideout before any more enemies arrive. Meanwhile, Wave receives his punishment for letting Tatsumi escape and she orders her team to capture Tatsumi alive if possible but also allows them to eliminate him if things get out of hand. Back at the hideout, Tatsumi informs everyone about the things he saw and found during his time at the Imperial Palace. Additionally, Akame informed everyone that Kurum thinks of her as a traitor even though she chose to stay in the capital when Akame offered to escape together. In the end, Akame makes up her mind to put an end to Ezdeth even if she is the most powerful in the capital. Dr. Stylish is also roaming around the forest with some creeps and he eventually manages to find the Night Raid's hideout. While everyone is chilling at the hideout, Leon goes out to wash her face and one of Dr. Stylish party members attacks and knocks Leon out. He sends more of his soldiers towards the hideout as well. Lubbock is the first one to encounter one of them and his strings don't affect their bodies as the modified soldiers are very flexible. He manages to take care of one but a whole army arrives and so does Akane. With a single strike of her sword, she manages to eliminate all of them but one of the main members of their group with an imperial arm arrives. While Akame is busy in her fight, Tatsumi goes out of the hideout and faces another one of Doctor's men. He whips out the imperial arm that Shiel used and seeing it in his hand makes Tatsumi lose his cool. Tatsumi attacks him aimlessly which results in his sword shattering upon impact. He keeps on getting tossed around until Mine arrives and she gets furious after seeing his imperial arm as well. Just when he lunges at Mine, she attacks him with one of her strongest beams, completely eradicating him and leaving no trace behind. At the same time, a flying danger beast arrives and surprisingly, Nejenda is the one riding it along with the two new members she brought for her team. 
On the other hand, Akim manages to cut off one of his opponent's limbs. However, he keeps on pressing her until Akim cuts off everything except for one leg and Lubbock manages to finish him off with a surprise attack from his back. While Mine and Tatsumi are looking at the flying danger beast, another one of Doctor's men attacks them from behind but is stopped by Leon who lands a brutal kick on his ugly disgusting face. She confronts him for attacking her like a wimp earlier and finishes him off with a single strike. Suddenly, several more of Doctor's modified beasts surround them and the remaining members of the night raid fall on the ground, not being able to move due to Doctor's paralyzing poison. Tatsumi, who is currently using Incursio is the only one left safe and decides to fight all the enemies in order to keep others safe. Just then, one of the comrades Nagenda brought lands near them and took care of all the enemies, eliminating them one by one without taking a single hit. Seeing how the doctor's plan is not working, he explodes all his test subjects and even when Suzanu receives a lot of injury, he is able to heal in an instant due to his abilities being an orgasmic type of imperial weapon. Furthermore, Nagenda finds the location of the doctor and orders Suzanu to deal with them. He soon manages to catch up to them and forces the doctor to take a potion which transforms him into a ginormous monster. Seeing how Suzanu is having difficulties fighting that monster alone, Tatsumi and Akim decide to give him a hand. While Mine uses her energy beams to make the doctor lose his balance, Akim dashes toward the doctor and cuts him in half. The other new member that Nagenda brought along is Chelsea and she starts making fun of Mine as soon as they land on the surface. Nagenda reveals that Chelsea has almost the same level of experience as Akim while Suzanu is Nagenda's new imperial arm. Not only is he good at combat, but also manages to build a new hideout for the team and also cooks food after he is done with the construction. Apparently, he was originally created as an Imperial Arms bodyguard which is the reason behind his combat abilities mixed with the talent of doing household chores. On the other hand, Run informs Esdeth about Doctor's disappearance and she pays Suryu a visit, who is weeping because both her sugar datas were eliminated by the enemy. Back at the hideout, Nagenda tells everyone to increase their strength by training as they will need to become even more powerful in order to defeat their enemies. The next day, Nagenda brags about how Suzanu has been asleep for all this time and only responds to her. Suzanu agrees and informs everyone that she reminds him of his old boss who was also a general. Hearing him compare their boss with a muscular man makes Tatsumi and Leon crack up, resulting in them receiving a beating from Nagenda. Meanwhile, Mine is enjoying her cake when a cat appears and steals it from her. Turns out that the car is actually Chelsea and she transformed into one because of her imperial arm, which allows her to transform into anything she desires. The next morning, Leon and Tatsumi go out to defeat some dragons and during their fight, Leon notices that Tatsumi has been slowly getting close to how Bulat used to be. After the two of them return, Nagenda asks Chelsea about her experience after staying with Night Raid for a month. She replies that Night Raid is stronger than her previous team but according to her, strength is not the only thing as their previous two members met their demise because they were failures as assassin. At night, Mine along with Tatsumi and Lubbock discuss how Chelsea mocked Sheil and Bule. The three of them are pissed at her for badmouthing them and plan to take revenge. Lubbock gives Tatsumi the idea to sneak up on Chelsea while she is taking a bath and scare her. Even though Tatsumi hesitates for a second, the thought of seeing a woman's plot helps him make up his mind. Later that night, he transforms into incursion and turns on his invisibility ability to slowly sneak up on her, only to realize that the person taking the bath is Suzanu. He advises Tatsumi to be more cautious as even though Incursio hides his physical body, the enemies are still able to detect his presence. Suddenly, Suzanu transforms into Chelsea and she reveals that Tatsumi's presence was easily detected by her which made her transform into Suzanu to confront him. Furthermore, Chelsea reveals that her whole team was eliminated during their last mission and the only reason she harshly said those words about Sheil and Bulat was because she didn't want to lose any more of her comrades. The same night, a family is hanging out in their house when mysterious beasts attack them and devour the whole family. The next day, the Emperor praises Esdeath for her contributions and later, the Night Raid reveals the information about the beasts appearing in the forest and asks Esdeath to take care of them. Later that day, the same beasts attack a group of merchants but Balls burn them to crisp before the beast even gets a chance to hurt them. Instead of thanking Balls, the merchant gets terrified by his appearance and shows their gratitude to Suryu instead. After returning back to the Imperial Palace, Wave tries to console Balls for receiving the harsh punishment because of her appearance but realizes that he worries for nothing when his beautiful wife and daughter arrive to pay Balls a visit. On the other hand, Tatsumi is busy training with Suzanu and he advises Tatsumi to always find the weak point of his enemies. The conversation then shifts to Tatsumi calling Suzanu a member of their gang but they are interrupted when Akim arrives and informs them about the beasts that have been appearing around the forest lately. 
Later, they all gather around in their new hideout and Nagenda informs them about all the information she was able to gather about the beasts. She orders them to take care of them and ignore the Jaegers as they are already working on their extermination. While everyone agrees, Chelsea thinks otherwise and believes that it is best if they let Jaegers take care of them. Tatsumi replies and tells Chelsea that even though they are assassins, the night raid is still on the people's side, and they need to do everything in order to make sure no innocent person is eliminated because of the beast. Instead of praising him for the speech, Suzanu reveals that Tatsumi's fly has been open for a while and requests him to close it. This results in Tatsumi drowning in embarrassment while the others make fun of him for acting cool even when his junk is revealed. Nagenda tells Chelsea that the whole squad is like this and even though she likes their attitude, she is still worried that this kindness might take Tatsumi's life one day. Meanwhile, Ran informs Esdeath about the whole situation that happened to the doctor and reveals that the mysterious beasts could, in fact, be a creation of his. At night, Tatsumi and Lubbock head out to take care of the beasts, and Tatsumi asks Lubbock the reason he always calls Nagenda so respectfully. Lubbock finally shares his secret and tells Tatsumi that he belonged to a rich household and nothing really interests him until his eyes are laid upon Nagenda. He followed her and joined the army, staying by her side even when she became the leader of the night raid. Eventually, they decide to split up and find the beats. Tatsumi heads to the top of the mountain to get a better view and removes Incursio. Simultaneously, Esdeath is flying on a magic beast when she notices someone standing on the mountain. Thinking that it is an enemy, she makes a perfect landing only to realize that it is none other than the love of her life. The beast tries attacking them but Esdeath takes care of them in an instant, looking forward to the time they will be spending together. After taking care of the beasts, she gives Tatsumi a hug and praises him for becoming even stronger since the last time she saw him. However, their happy reunion is interrupted when the person who controls the beast appears in front of Esdeath and Tatsumi. He deploys a magic circle which teleports both of them to some other place. Apparently, that place is an island in the middle of nowhere. As Death informs Tatsumi that some of the Imperial arms have the ability to control space and time which might be the ability due to which they were teleported, without wasting any more time. As Death makes an ice tower to get a better view of their location and later mentions how this feels like a date. Suddenly, a ginormous beast appears which looks similar to the Doctor's transformed state. As Death attacks it using ice spikes but it is not enough to defeat it. Tatsumi notices that the spot on the beast's forehead seems fragile and advises her to target it instead of the beast's body. However, before Esdeath gets a chance, Tatsumi runs at the beast and cuts the fragile spot, defeating the beast. Eventually, Esdeath lands the finishing blow by crushing the beast with a giant ice ball, and seeing her powers makes Tatsumi question if a meat master like Akame is enough to defeat her. After they defeat the beast, both of them explore the island and gather everything that they might need in order to survive. Eventually, Night falls and a small magic circle appears. As Death informs Tatsumi that they might be able to teleport back as according to her, a real magic circle could appear on the places that are already marked. While they wait for the magic circle to appear, As Death asks Tatsumi about his life to which Tatsumi replies that he learned swordsmanship from a teacher in their village and he also taught him the art of forging a weapon. Afterward, Tatsumi realizes that it might be a perfect opportunity to gather information and asks Esdeath about her past. Esdeath informs him that she is not originally from the capital but from a clan called Partis. It is a race that targets wild beasts, and she was the daughter of the clan's leader. They all used to live peacefully and hunt beasts to make a living until one day. They were attacked by the northern tribe and her father met his demise as a result. This made Tatsumi think that her battle with the Northern Tribe after becoming a general might be to avenge her father but surprisingly, she didn't have such feelings. The only reason she attacked them was because it was what she was ordered to do by the capital. Furthermore, he asks her about her imperial arm to which she replies that a few years ago, the Night Raid gave her the choice to choose any imperial weapon she desired. As expected, the most powerful imperial arm caught her attention and even though it had taken the lives of people who tried to make a contract with it, Esdeath still gave it a try and successfully managed to form a contract. Having this conversation made Tatsumi realize that Esdeath is a twisted person to begin with and he can never bring her to their side. After their conversation ends, the magic circle finally appears and Tatsumi enters it before Esdeath and manages to hide using his invisibility ability before she gets a chance to find him after returning back to the mountain. A higher-up was chilling in his room when Chelsea, who has taken the form of a maid, infiltrates his room and stabs him with a needle, ending his life. Suddenly, Wave and Kirum arrive in the room as well and Chelsea manages to hide herself by transforming into a cat. Back at the hideout, Leon and Lubbock start to mock Tatsumi for enjoying his time with Esdeath on a deserted island while everyone else is busy fighting for their lives. Afterward, Nagenda informs them about their mission which is regarding Path of Peace, the religious group that has been gaining popularity lately. 
According to Nagenda, the path of peace will most likely revolt against the corrupt government of the empire, and they will need to take advantage of it. The revolutionary army will join due to which the capital will have to face enemies from both the inside and outside the city. This battle will surely create an opening for the night raid to deal with that pig of a prime minister. However, the path of peace is currently not in the best spot as their current advisor. Bollock is actually a spy sent by the prime minister. The night raid will first have to deal with Bollock which will allow the path of peace to successfully contribute to the final battle. But before the final battle, Nagenda plans on dealing with the Jaegers and wants to lure them out of the capital and attack them. On the other hand, Run arrives and informs Esdeth that Akim and Mine were spotted near the eastern side of capital and Esdeth plans to make full use of this opportunity to hunt them. Six of the Jaegers head out and a few spies of the revolutionary army end up spotting them and relaying the message to Nagenda. While they are waiting for the Jaegers to arrive, the night raid members start to have front by the river and Lubbock can't stand the fact that girls are showing off their swimsuits to Tatsumi and Nodin on their way to where the night raid was stopped. Esdeth mentions that either the night raid has lowered their guard and was spotted because of it or it is a trap. Nonetheless, Esdeth doesn't care whichever one it is and wants to rush and defeat them once and for all. She splits them into two teams and asks Wave, Balls, and Kiron to go after Akame while the others pursue Nagenda. With that being said, Kiron's group finally enters the valley where they find a suspicious-looking scarecrow. Little did they know that they were in Mine's target range and she had her eyes on them from afar. After taking a look at Kiron, Mine realizes that she looks exactly like Akame and decides to take care of Kiron by herself and not leave the job for Akame, as it could be painful for her. Mine then fires at Kiron and she somehow manages to dodge it in the nick of time. But they don't have much time to settle down as Suzanu appears and sends Wave flying away with a single strike. Along with Suzanu, the rest of the night raid also reveals themselves. Kirom is delighted to see her older sister and summons all her undead to make up for their lack of comrades. Without wasting another second, Akam dashes forward and asks a few of the members to take the beast together but Suzanu offers to fight it alone, as his strength is enough to take something like that down. Meanwhile, another one of Kirom's undead attacks mine and she uses guns as well, and it turns out to be the perfect type of battle for mine. Meanwhile, Tatsumi is facing his doppelganger, which is a wild monkey and one of Kirom's undead. Akame is busy fighting but a man with a whip takes her down. While Akame is busy fighting the puppets, Kirom informs her that all of the puppets were once alive and she eliminated them during their fight, making the skilled ones her puppets for future use, including her childhood friend Suzanu to use the secret ability he has. While Tatsumi is fighting the monkey, Chelsea transforms into a tribe man and defeats a puppet from the same tribe, as even though they are undead, the memories of their past lives are still sealed somewhere inside their minds. Furthermore, Tatsumi finally locks in and defeats the monkey, showcasing the superior one among them. Mine also manages to defeat the puppet she is fighting but just then, a holes inside its stomach and manage to get out of it unharmed. The tables soon turn in the night raid's favor when Nagenda and Suzanu arrive to help Tatsumi while Hyon manages to break Ball's imperial arm using her teeth. Before Akame can strike him out, Balls throws the container on his back and explodes it. Luckily, everyone manages to get away after the explosion unharmed and the battle ends. Balls is also getting away from the battlefield when he notices a girl crying under a tree. He goes to check up on her and after he is done treating her wounds, he finds out that it is actually Chelsea who stabs him with her needles, ending his life for good. After she has taken care of Balls, Chelsea meets up with Lubbock and tells him that she will be going after Kirom next. Even though Lubbock tries to stop her, Chelsea decides to go after her anyway, stating the fact that if they let her go then she most likely returns with even more powerful puppets. With that being said, she takes the form of Balls and walks around the forest to find Kirom. Meanwhile, Kirom is sitting alone in the forest and while waiting for his comrades to regroup, she starts contemplating her childhood when Akim and she were forced to train and experimented on by the military. On the other hand, the whole night raid has gathered at their hideout after the battle as well. Leon informs everyone that her arm can be reattached and Lubbock will most likely be able to do it using his strengths. Chelsea finally manages to find Kirom and surprisingly, she doesn't have a clue that it is not the real balls. After analyzing her for a while, Chelsea decides to wait for the perfect opportunity and doesn't want to rush things for her own good. After hearing the news from Lubbock, Nagenda orders Akame and Tatsumi to go and bring back Chelsea. Meanwhile, Kurom starts feeling lightheaded after walking for a while and Chelsea uses this opportunity to stab her using a needle. Afterward, Chelsea remembers her past and how insane and was part of all sorts of gruesome acts. One day, Chelsea headed to the basement and came across the imperial arm she currently uses. Soon after, she managed to eliminate the cocky higher-up and decided to spend the rest of her life helping others who are in trouble. Back in the present, Chelsea realizes that Kurom is not completely eliminated as the experiment she was a part of gave her some sort of buff. 
her puppets appeared and started following Chelsea, eventually shooting and putting an end to her. In her last moments, Chelsea realizes that she is the one who is about to experience the fate of a murderer and thinks about how she was looking forward to Tatsumi's admiration if she had succeeded. On the other hand, Tatsumi splits from Akim and runs around the capital looking for Chelsea when he notices a commotion in the middle of town. He goes to take a look and can't believe what he just saw. People are gathered around a pole on which Chelsea's head is placed as a sign of Jaeger's victory. Even after losing Chelsea, Tatsumi decides to stay focused on the mission as their fight is still going on. The Night Raid arrives near the Path of Peace headquarters and is planning on taking care of their leader, who is a spy of the Prime Minister. Coincidentally, the Jaegers appear there as well and as death informs Balak, the leader, that they are sent by the Prime Minister to protect him. Surprisingly, he has some of his own fighters as well and introduces them to the Jaegers. Apparently, all of them are confident in their abilities and claim that they have destroyed Imperial arms with their bare hands. While the Jaegers are at their hotel, Kirom loses consciousness and the injuries she sustained from Chelsea have left a grave impact on her. Soon after, Kirom wakes up and informs everyone that she is back to her usual self after a bit of rest. As Death tests her claims but lands a kick and Kirom manages to defend herself. However, after their meeting with Balak, Kirom starts feeling unwell once again and asks Wave to keep her condition a secret as she will be kicked out of Jaegers if others find out about it. The next day, Mine and Tatsumi are walking around the city and he buys some ice cream, making Mine realize how well Tatsumi is holding himself after Chelsea's demise. Additionally, Lubbock is also roaming around the city to gather as much information as possible, but he gets unlucky when Bollock's men notice his presence and mark him as their enemy. At night, Akame is having a conversation with some of their men to find out the best route to infiltrate Bollock's headquarters when one of Bollock's men arrives, looking forward to his fight with Akame. Apparently, he is one of the guys Akame trained with and the fight between them starts. At the same time, the two other Bollock men are after Lubbock as well and after getting hit by them, Lubbock decides to act as if he is already eliminated. However, his plan messes up when the girl he was supposed to meet arrives and becomes a target of Bollock's men. Having no other choice, he decides to end his acting and gets back up to fight the two of them on his own. On the other hand, after a short confrontation, Akame easily manages to cut her opponent into pieces and proves the fact that she is leagues above his skill level. However, the battle is still not over as Run arrives and instead of attacking her, he flies away after gathering information. Lubbock manages to defend himself against their attacks and makes a spear with his strings, which ultimately stabs the big guy in his chest. Surprisingly, the trick is still not ever as the strings undo their shapes and slice off the big guy's heart from the inside, resulting in an instant demise. Now only the girl is left and a weird liquid starts coming out of her body which covers all his strings, making them completely useless. She attacks him with her superhuman speed and just when the girl is about to put an end to him, two daggers appear from behind and stab the girl, which were controlled by the strings Lubbock had kept hidden from her. Meanwhile, Tatsumi and Mine are resting on the mountain when the founder of Path of Peace arrives and introduces himself, advising Mine and Tatsumi to become a couple. This statement makes them furious, and it results in a fight between the two. The next morning, the Jaegers are hanging out around the town with the new member that just joined them who is called Suzuka. Meanwhile, Nagenda plans on infiltrating the Peace Path headquarters on the night of the festival and blending in with the crowd to make things easier for them. With that being said, Suzanu arrives and brings a ton of food for everyone. Everyone gets the meals apart from Tatsumi, who receives a kid's meal with a little flag on it. Later that day, Tatsumi and Mine go around the town after canceling them but get found out and are forced to get away from the city. Suryu manages to find them and is surprised after seeing Tatsumi hanging out with Night Raid's members. She rains down multiple rockets on them but Tatsumi barely escapes along with Mine. Thinking that they are far enough to rest, Suzuka arrives and attacks them but they both are able to dodge it flawlessly. Tatsumi decides to take on Suzuka and asks Mine to fight Suryu. Eventually, Suryu catches up to them and fires a military-grade missile at her but Mine remains unscratched. Following that, Mine starts randomly shooting bullets at Koro and Suryu orders Koro to transform after realizing that Mine is trying to damage its core. After Koro's transformation, the battle becomes even harder for Mine and she starts getting cornered while taking damage at the same time. On the other hand, Suzanu along with Leon and Akame also infiltrates the headquarters. Kirum arrives to defend the place and just when Leon is about to attack her, Wave arrives and asks Leon to fight him instead. As Death enters Bollock's room and orders him to stay there while stabbing his face with her heels, giving him the time of his life. Meanwhile, even after sustaining a lot of damage, Tatsumi keeps on fighting Suzuka and has an idea to use brute force to take her down. He breaks the building where they are fighting and the falling debris crushes Suzuka, ending their fight with Tatsumi as the victor. Simultaneously, Mine thinks about all the hardships she has gone through and makes up her mind to not lose this easily. 
Her imperial arm responds to her emotions and with a terrifyingly strong laser beam, she cuts both Koro and Suryu in half finally avenging one of her best friends at the night raid. However, Suryu has one last move and she plans on self-destructing to make sure she takes Mine life as well. Without wasting any more time, Mine tries to run as far as she can and just when she is about to get enveloped by the explosion, Tatsumi arrives and manages to save her. She shows her gratitude for saving her life and slowly starts falling for him. Luckily, Balik doesn't listen to Ezdeth and leaves his chamber, eventually running into Lubbock and Akim who finish him off. After hearing about what happened at the Peace Paths headquarters, the higher up of the capital starts panicking and the Prime Minister calms them down and introduces his son to them. He plans on teaming up with the chief commander of the capital to put an end to the night raid for good. The next day, Tatsumi and Lubbock are keeping tabs on the military's activity and discuss how they will be taking advantage of the commotion and sneak into the palace to finish the prime minister. At the same time, Leon and Mine are discovering the underground water system of the capital to find the best way to infiltrate the palace. Leon suddenly asks Mine about her relationship with Tatsumi as she has been noticing some changes in their behavior. Mine blushes for a while but dodges the question and goes on to complete their task. On their way to meet up with an accomplice, Lubbock tells Tatsumi about how he plans to propose his love to Nagenda after the battle is over and then asks Tatsumi about how far he has gone with Mine. Just when they are messing around, the person they are supposed to meet arrives and takes them inside the palace. She is part of the resistance against the capital, and as her father was the emperor's teacher, she has access to all the places. The reason she is helping them is because both her parents are imprisoned by the prime minister. They finally arrive at the place where the other members are and upon entering the building, they notice a room full of corpses. Apparently, Shura had already found out their plan and lured them into his trap. Not only Shura but the chief commander of the capital also arrives to fight them. While Tatsumi fights the chief commander, Lubbock takes on the scar face. Apparently, he has the ability to teleport wherever he wants and it makes it easier for him to attack Lubbock from every possible angle. During their fight, Shura injects a substance that boosts his strength and increases the power of his ability. No matter where Lubbock tries to run, Shura appears and attacks him. On the other hand, Tatsumi keeps on trying to attack the chief commander and he uses his lighting ability on Tatsumi, dealing an immense amount of damage. Suddenly, the girl who helped them restricts Lubbock's movements but Shura cuts her down, warning her to not interfere with his fight. The way he treats the girl enraged Lubbock and he severs Shura's arm. Apparently, Lubbock was not just running around but was carefully placing his strings all over the place. Just when Lubbock thinks that the battle is over, the girl stabs him from behind and asks Shura to let her parents go and he reveals that her parents have already met their demise. With this last chance he got, Shura teleports Lubbock into space but little does he know that a string is still attached to his arm. Lubbock forces Shura to come along and then stabs his heart with a spear. After finishing him off, Shura's ability disappears and Lubbock is brought back to the world but is teleported in the sky. He falls to his demise, thinking of the time he spent with the Night Raid and how he won't be seeing the agenda anymore. Tatsumi, who is already captured watched Lubbock fall to his demise and screams in pain. The Prime Minister doesn't care after hearing news about his son passing away and is glad that Tatsumi was captured by the chief commander. The next day, flyers are spread around the town, announcing Tatsumi's public execution. At night, Mine tells Akim that she will be going to save Tatsumi. And it turns out that she is not the only one with that plan in mind as the whole night raid has decided to help the loser out. On the other hand, Ezdeth pays Tatsumi a visit to his jail cell and even after finding out that he is with the night raid, she gives him another chance to join her. However, he refuses and she informs him that his only option other than joining her is execution. Tatsumi still doesn't budge and Ezdeth decides that she will be the one to execute him with her own two hands. After hearing this news, Wave can't believe that Ezdeth will eliminate someone she likes with her own two hands. Run informs him that it is more reasonable for her to do it than someone else. Kurum agrees and tells Wave that she feels the same way and wants to be the one who puts an end to her sister because she still loves her. The next morning, the whole capital along with the Emperor gathers at the stadium where Tatsumi will be publicly executed. Afterward, Ezdeth steps into the ground and just when she is about to end Tatsumi's life, Mine fires her energy beams at her. The commotion makes all the citizens run away, and the chief commander decides to fight Mine. Meanwhile, Nagenda appears in front of Ezdeth along with Suzanu and their fight commences. At the same time, Leon and Mine start fighting the chief commander but he overpowers both of them and attacks Leon using his electricity. He then starts attacking Mine and she purposely fully puts herself in a bind so her imperial arm can gather more energy from her spike of emotions. Akim also enters the palace and fights off all the guards in order to retrieve Tatsumi's incursio. Ezdeth manages to freeze Suzanu but Nagenda allows him to use the forbidden ability and with that being said, she only has one for use left until her life force fully drains. Suzanu transforms and after freeing himself from the ice, 
He starts fighting as death on somewhat more equal terms. During their battle, Mine tries to run away and save Tatsumi but gets attacked by the chief commander. He then decides to put an end to Mine and charges for his ultimate attack. However, Mine also uses her full strength and gives it all she has. The amount of energy released even damages her imperial arm and she manages to brunt the chief commander to a crisp. During Suzanu's fight with Asdeath, she turns the table by using an ability that even freezes time itself. Asdeath uses this chance to break Suzanu's core and completely crushes it. However, Nagender refuses to let him go and allows Suzanu to use the forbidden ability once more and this marks the third usage. Suzanu comes back to life and holds Asdeath off while the others escape. He is fully aware that his powers are not a match to Asdeath and says his goodbye to everyone before they leave. On the other hand, Tatsumi is running away with Mine in his arms but she requests him to put her down. Mine thanks Tatsumi for always saving her and tells him that her injuries can't heal like Leon and this is most probably it for her. Mine then informs Tatsumi that she is glad that she fell in love with him and kisses him afterward. Sadly, Mine then passed away and Tatsumi couldn't do anything but scream in pain. After returning back to the hideout, Everyone is shocked after losing two more of their comrades. Tatsumi regrets that they came to help him out and Leon asks him to calm down as Nagenda is also grieving her partner, Suzanu. Wave and Run also find out what happened and Run comments on how this nation won't last very long. Surprisingly, Run is really calm and collected and tells Wave that the only reason he joined Jaegers was to change this corrupted nation from the inside. Afterward, Kirom also arrives and Run asks Kirom about her next move as she doesn't have much time left. On the other hand, Asdeath is fighting the revolutionary army and contemplates Tatsumi being the perfect man for her, considering how he survived such an inescapable situation. Later that day, Tatsumi and Akame head out into the town and notice a message written on the bodies of men who were eliminated by Kuro. Apparently, it is a message for Akame as Kuro wants her to come near the Kadai Forest facility for their final battle. Later that night, Akame heads out to the location and meets up with Kuro. Both the sisters quietly sit in the church and reminisce about their past. Kirom tells Akame that she used to love her so much but all that was for nothing as Akame eventually betrayed her to join Night Raid. Following that, Kirom calls her puppets and the fight between them commences. Akame fights all three of them at once and during their fight, she tries to make Kirom believe that it is not possible for her to keep assassinating innocent citizens on the corrupt higher-ups orders. Their fight is interrupted when a giant beast wakes up and starts attacking them. Both Kirom's puppets are crushed by it and the beast attacks Kirom but Akame manages to save her. For the time being, both of them decide to team up and they easily eliminate the beast. Kirom mentions how good their teamwork is and with that being said, their battle continues. She calls more of her undead puppets but most of them are normal soldiers and Akame deals with them in an instant. Akame then dashes towards Kirom but is forced to step back when Wave arrives. However, he is not the only one as Tatsumi also appears and tells Wave to not interrupt their fight. Kirom also agrees and requests Wave to let them fight and he eventually agrees. The battle once again continues in this time. Akame gets the upper hand and she manages to finish Kirom off. Wave starts regretting his powerlessness and Akame tells him that coming to the battlefield was more than enough. She then hands over Kirom's body to Wave and he takes her away. After everything is done, Akame can't hold her emotions any longer and screams in pain while hugging Tatsumi. At night, Wave buries Kirom and tells her that his main goal was to protect the capital but he is unsure what to do anymore. At the hideout, Akame comments on how empty the place feels and Nagenda informs everyone about the night raid's last mission, which is to eliminate the Prime Minister. The next morning, Nagenda charged towards the capital along with the whole revolutionary army. At the same time, Akame, Tatsumi, and Leon infiltrate the palace and make their way towards the throne room after eliminating all the guards. Unfortunately, Run comes in their way and the fight between them starts. He informs Leon about his wish to change the corrupt nation as well to which she replies that he should be on their side. However, Run is not a fan of all the destruction the night raid causes and only wants to change things from the inside. Later, Leon asks the other two to leave while she handles Run on her own. At the same time, the Prime Minister persuades the Emperor to use the ultimate weapon as he will be able to settle everyone down by demonstrating his authority. Suddenly, Akame and Tatsumi enter the room and she heads straight for the Prime Minister's head. But an invisible shield protects him and he tells Akame that the ultimate weapon has already been activated. The floor starts breaking and a ginormous robot emerges from within the palace. Everyone is surprised to see it and the Emperor starts attacking aimlessly in order to demonstrate his authority. The Prime Minister riles him up and the Emperor mindlessly accepts his praise and keeps on attacking the town. Tatsumi gets enraged and dashes towards the robot, trying to land some attacks but none of them seem to have any effect. The Emperor manages to catch Tatsumi and throws him on the ground. Just when he is about to step on him, Wave arrives and saves Tatsumi. He lets Tatsumi know that his sole goal is to protect the people of the capital. 
On the other hand, Leon saves run from flying debris and they both decide to put their fight aside and save as many people as they can. After tanking a lot of attacks, Tatsumi manages to find a place that deals more damage to the robot than any other part and it reminds him of the time when Suzanu taught him to find weakness. Tatsumi asks Wave to create an opening for him and he rushes towards the weak spot, attacking it using as much force as possible. Unfortunately, the Emperor deals with him by blasting Tatsumi away. Wave tries to help him out but gets attacked by him as well. Surprisingly, Tatsumi has still not given up and he gets back on his feet, calling out in Curcio's name. This time, the Imperial weapon responds to his emotions and upgrades itself to its truest form. This time, Tatsumi manages to dodge all the attacks and completely breaks the weak point. The robot starts falling at a place where citizens are present. Even though he is gravely injured, Tatsumi puts his all into stopping the robot before it crushes the citizens. Akame also appears and gives him a hug, confronting him for not keeping his promise of returning back alive as Tatsumi also passes away. As Death also arrives at the scene and realizes that the love of her life passed away. The capital's military tries to capture Ake, but as Death freezes all of them to their demise, commenting on how she serves a pathetic nation. She then makes a ring using her ice where only she and Akeim can fight each other. Both of them pull out their swords and rush towards each other. As Death tries to freeze Ake, but she takes out her glove at the right time, avoiding being frozen to her demise. The battle is very much equal for both sides. Akame tries to make Esdeath stop by commenting on how this fight is useless as the capital has already been lost. However, Esdeath doesn't care and continues to fight, telling Akame that she can't bear the rambling of a pig. After a while of back and forth blows, Esdeath kicks Akame down and steps on her. However, a sudden explosion forces her to step away and after getting back up, Akame cuts herself with the sword. By doing this, poison spreads inside her body and instead of hurting her, it gives Akame even more power than she initially possessed. Due to her transformed state, Esda starts having difficulty handling Akame as she even manages to land a hit on Esda. Poison starts spreading in her body but Esda cuts off her arm to prevent the poison from spreading any further. Akame then starts using her supernatural speed to avoid getting hit by Esda's attacks but it doesn't last very long as Esda pauses time once again. She stabs the Akame in front of her, only to realize it is an afterimage. Soon after, the time freezing ability runs out and Akame attacks Esdeath from above. This time, the poison starts spreading and Akame informs Esdeath that she already knew about her time freezing ability from the time she used it on Suzanu. Esdeath accepts her loss and walks towards Tatsumi's body. She freezes both him and her to their demise, as she wants to stay with the person she loves till the end. On the other hand, the Prime Minister tries to run away but is confronted by Leon. He uses his one-time ability which seals away Leon's imperial arm. He then takes out a gun and shoots Leon non-stop. However, she still bears the pain and manages to smash his head till there is nothing left. Afterward, she meets Akame for one last time and after saying goodbye to her friends in the slums, she passes away. The next day, the Emperor accepts his mistakes and is publicly executed for all the crimes he committed. Tatsumi's villagers also receive some compensation from the capital, and they praise Tatsumi for doing the things he promised. A few days later, the capital starts rebuilding itself and Nagenda informs Akame that even though her life has been shortened due to using Suzanu's forbidden ability, she still hopes to do as much as she can as a survivor. Before leaving, Akame tells Nagenda to put all the blame on her while she takes the role of rebuilding the capital to the place it should have been from the start. They shake hands for one last time and go their separate ways afterward. This was all about our assassins. Will Nagenda be able to create a nation where everyone lives peacefully? Comment Night Raid below and let us know if you enjoyed watching the show. Make sure to like and subscribe. See you guys in the next video.